Good day and welcome to Bible Class Topics. Today, we want to study a lesson entitled, Nothing But the Blood of Jesus. Let's start by reading Colossians 1, 13 and 14. We're going to read these two verses from the King James Version. Who hath delivered us from the power of darkness, and hath translated us into the kingdom of his dear Son, Paul's talking about God here. God's delivered us from the power of darkness. He's translated us in the kingdom of his dear son, his dear son in whom we have redemption through his blood, even the forgiveness of sins. Sin is real. It's the most terrible reality known to man. Experience, history, and the Bible verify this truth. Sins and their consequences are terrible when they're confined to this earth life, but the long-term effects reach into eternity. And the long-term effects of unforgiven sins leads to the eternal punishment of the wicked. Peter said this in his second letter, chapter 2, verses 4 through 9. For if God did not spare angels when they sinned, but cast them into hell and committed them to chains of gloomy darkness to be kept until the judgment, if he did not spare the ancient world, but preserved Noah, a herald of righteousness with seven others, when he brought a flood upon the world of the ungodly, if by turning the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah to ashes he condemned them to extinction, making them an example of what is going to happen to the ungodly. And if he rescued righteous Lot, greatly distressed by the sensual conduct of the wicked, for as that righteous man lived among them day after day, he was tormenting his righteous soul over their lawless deeds that he saw and heard. Then the Lord knows how to rescue the godly from trials and to keep the unrighteous under punishment until the day of judgment especially those who indulge in the lust of defiling passion and despise authority. Then in Revelation 21, verse 8, as the revelation is coming to a close, we hear this, But as for the cowardly, the faithless, the detestable, as for murderers, the sexually immoral, sorcerers, idolaters, and all liars, their portion will be in the lake that burns with fire and with sulfur, which is the second death. We entitled our lesson, Nothing But the Blood of Jesus, and right away I am reminded of the hymn written in 1876 by Robert Lowry entitled, Nothing But the Blood of Jesus. Let me read four of the verses uh, of that hymn, and and the chorus. What can wash away my sins? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. What can make me whole again? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. For my portion this I see, for my cleansing this my plea. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Nothing can for sin atone, naught of good that I have done. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. This is all my hope and peace. This is all my righteousness. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. O oh, precious is the flow that makes me white as snow. No other fount I know. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. I'll put the lyrics to this hymn in the description below. We want to talk then about three topics in today's lesson, sin and blood from the beginning, remission of sins comes via Christ's blood, and how Christ's blood brings remission of sins. Sin entered into the world before laws concerning blood. Listen to Genesis 3, 1 through 5. Now the serpent was more crafty than any other beast of the field that the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, did God actually say, You shall not eat of any tree in the garden? And the woman said to the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees in the garden, but God said, You shall not eat of the fruit of the tree that is in the midst of the garden, 
neither shall you touch it, lest you die. But the serpent said to the woman, You will not surely die. For God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be open, and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. After Adam and Eve are removed from the garden and they begin to have a family, we see that time goes along and God begins to preach through Noah that life is in the blood and that it's a sin to eat blood. Furthermore, those who shed blood shall have their blood shed. Genesis 9, 4 through 6, But you shall not eat flesh while it's life, that is, it's blood. And for your life blood I will require a reckoning, for every beast I will require it, and from man, from his fellow man I will require a reckoning of the life of man. Whoever sheds the blood of man may by man have his blood shed, for God made man in his own image. Let's back up a minute to the time of Cain and Abel. As early as the time of Cain and Abel, animal sacrifices were the pro proper sacrifices to be made to God. Genesis 4, 1 through 5a. Now Adam knew his wife Eve, and she conceived and bore Cain, saying, I've gotten a man with the help of the Lord. And again she bore his brother Abel. Now Abel was a keeper of sheep, and Cain a worker of the ground in the course of time. Cain brought to the Lord an offering of the fruit of the ground, and Abel also brought of the firstborn of his flock and of their fat portions. And the Lord had regard for Abel and his offering, but for Cain and his offering he had no regard. We know what happened later on. Cain could not bear the, this fact, and because he was jealous of his brother Abel, he killed him. In Hebrews chapter 10, verses 1 through 11, For since the law has but a shadow of the good things to come instead of the true form of these realities, it can never, by the same sacrifices that are continually offered every year, make perfect those who draw near. Otherwise, would they not have ceased to be offered, since the worshipers, having once been cleansed, would no longer have any consciousness of sin? But in these sacrifices, there is a reminder of sins every year. For it is impossible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sin. Consequently, when Christ came into the world, he said, Sacrifices and offerings you have not desired, but a body you have prepared for me. In burnt offerings and sin offerings you have taken no pleasure. Then I said, Behold, I have come to do your will, O God, as is written of me in the scroll of the books. When he said above, you have neither desired nor taken pleasure in sacrifices and offerings and burnt offerings and sin offerings. These are offered according to the law. Then he added, Behold, I have come to do your will. He does away with the first in order to establish the second. And by that will we have been sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. Only Christ's blood, then, can bring remission of sins. His blood remits sins under both the Old and the New Covenant. Paul wrote this to the Romans in chapter 3, verses 19 through 25. Now we know that whatever the law says, it speaks to those who are under the law, so that every mouth may be stopped and the whole world may be held accountable to God. For by works of the law, no human being will be justified in his sight since through the law comes knowledge of sin. But now the righteousness of God has been manifested apart from the law. Although the law and the prophets bear witness to it, the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all who believe. For there is no distinction, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God and are justified by his grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus whom God put forward as a propitiation by his blood to be received by faith. This was to show God's righteousness, because in his divine forbearance he had passed over the former sins. In Acts 2 and verse 38, when 
Peter was preaching and the congregation asked him what should they do to be saved, Peter said, repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. And you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. John wrote this in his first letter, chapter 1, verse 7, but if we walk in the light, as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all sins. So here we've already begun a contrast between animal blood versus Christ's blood. Let's read a few more passages back to Hebrews, chapter 9, this time, verse 13 through 15. For if the blood of goats and bulls and the sprinkling of defiled persons with the ashes of a heifer sanctify for the purification of the flesh, how much more will the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without blemish to God, purifying our conscience from dead works to serve the living God. Therefore, he is the mediator of a new covenant, so that those who are called may receive the promised eternal inheritance since a death has occurred that redeems them from the transgression committed under the first covenant. Then in chapter 10, verse 4, For it is impossible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sins, as we've already read earlier. Matthew 26, 28, Jesus said, For this is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. And Paul, in Ephesians chapter 1, verse 7, In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses, according to the riches of his grace. If you'd be interested in studying the book of Hebrews further, or the book of Romans, I have playlists for both of those books here on the channel. You can click below and go to the channel homepage and then click on playlist and find those playlists available. While we're still talking about Christ's blood, let's talk about the twofold efficacy of his blood. We've already seen it in our reading of Hebrews 10, 1 through 4. Namely, the sacrificed blood of animals could not cleanse completely. Christ's sacrifice could cleanse completely. Revelation 7, 14, I said to him, Sir, you know, and he said to me, These are the ones coming out of the great tribulation. They washed their robes, and they made them white in the blood of the Lamb. Then in chapter 22, 14, Blessed are those who wash their robes so that they might have the right to the tree of life, and they may enter into the city by the gates. Christ's blood cleanses man of his sins, and Christ's blood brings to the saved a new song. Revelation 5 and verse 9, And they sang a new song, saying, Worthy are you to take the scroll and open its seals, for you were slain, and by your blood you ransom people for God from every tribe and language and people and nations. In the Old Testament, the prophet Zechariah, chapter 13, verse 1, said, On that day there shall be a fountain opened for the house of David and the inhabitants of Jerusalem to cleanse them from their sins and uncleanness. And this reminds me of another hymn, there is a fountain filled with blood, written by William Cowper in 1771 and published in 1771. I'll share three of the verses with you here and place the lyrics to the hymn in the description below. There is a fountain filled with blood drawn from Emmanuel's veins, and sinners plunged beneath the flood lose all their guilty stains. Dear dying lamb, thy precious blood shall never lose its power till all the ransomed church of God be saved to sin no more. Ere since by faith I saw the stream thy flowing wounds supply, redeeming love has been my theme and shall be till I die.
how Christ's blood then brings remission of sins. Number one, we as sinners must walk in humble obedience to God's will. Back to Hebrews chapter 12, verse 22 through 24. But you have come to Mount Zion and to the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, and to innumerable angels in the festal gathering, and to the assembly of the firstborn who are rolled in heaven, and to God, the judge of all, and to the spirits of the righteous made perfect, and to Jesus, the mediator of a new covenant, and to the sprinkled blood that speaks a better word than the blood of Abel. I'll call your attention back to 1 John 1, 7, which we read a moment ago. If we walk humbly in obedience to God's will, humble obedience to God's will, this is how we can gain and maintain reconciliation with God and be considered his people. If we are his people, then we have fellowship with God. And fellowship, then, is conditional on us keeping his commands or else be branded a liar by God. Back to 1 John, this time chapter 2, verses 4, 5, and 6. Whoever says, I know him, but does not keep his commandments is a liar, and the truth is not in him. But whoever keeps his word, in him truly the love of God is perfected. By this we may know that we are in him. Whoever says he abides in him ought to walk in the same way in which he walked. As we often say in this channel, and there's the hymn of the same name, Footsteps of Jesus. We need to walk in his footsteps. We must be fully obedient from a pure heart. Not only must we be fully obedient, Obedient from a pure heart, we must remain fully obedient from a pure heart if we expect to be cleansed by the blood. In John 4, verse 34, Jesus said to them, My food is to do the will of him who sent me and to accomplish his work. Then in chapter 5, verse 30, I can do nothing on my own. As I hear, I judge, and my judgment is just because I seek not my own will, but the will of him who sent me. Then in chapter 15, verse 10, Jesus says, If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. Then back to 1 John, this time chapter 2 and verses 1 through 3. We've already read verses uh, 4, 5, and 6, but let's back up a little bit and look at verses 1, 2, and 3. My little children. I'm writing these things to you so that you may not sin. But if anyone does sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. He is the propitiation for our sins and not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. And by this we know that we have come to know him, what? If we keep his commandments. Later in chapter 5, verse 3, John reiterates, what the love of God is. For this is the love of God, that we keep his commandments, and his commandments are not burdensome. Obviously, none of us are deity. None of us are perfect. We are all human beings. We are going to stumble, but God expects us to give him all of our heart, and he will give us an opportunity to repent when we stumble. Just look at the Old Testament and see how many times and time and time again that God allowed the children of Israel to repent of their falling away. And they fell away often. And yet each time when they came to their senses and repented of their sins and started following God the Father and stopped following idols, he forgave them, and they came back into a reconciled state with him. Sin brought all the evil and all the suffering to man. Not only physical suffering, but also spiritual suffering, as well as physical death and spiritual death. We've seen in our lesson today that sin affects man, angels, the earth, heaven, time, eternity, and fills hell with the disobedient. 
We need a Savior. What did we read earlier in Colossians 1, 13 and 14? Who hath delivered us from the power of darkness and hath translated us into the kingdom of his dear Son? God, in whom we have what? Redemption through his blood, even the forgiveness of sins. In this short passage of two verses, Paul prevents, presents four saving actions of Christ. First, he delivered us, verse 13, delivered us from the power of Satan and from the guilt and penalty of sin. Secondly, he translated us. We could say transferred us into his kingdom. He redeemed us, verse 14, through his sacrifice on the cross. Christ paid the ransom for our sins. And he has forgiven us, verse 14. Our debt has been canceled. As we have been forgiven, though, we have to understand that we must also forgive. Later in that same letter, the letter to the Colossians, in chapter 3, verses 12 and 13, Paul said, Put on then, as God's chosen ones, holy and beloved, compassionate hearts, kindness, humility, meekness, and patience, bearing with one another. And if one has a complaint against another, forgiving each other as the Lord has forgiven you. So you also must forgive. We need a Savior. He is the kind of Savior that can deliver us, translate us, redeem us, and forgive us. And we must forgive others as well. We need to have his blood applied. Through his blood, and only through his blood, Will we be remitted of our sins and be in a right relationship with the Godhood? If you ever need to contact me privately, you can drop me a line at BibleClassTopics at gmail.com. And if you would like a PDF document of any of the lessons on this channel, just put the name of that lesson in the the subject line of your email and I will get that back to you as quickly as I can. The sermon today was taken from an outline I found in the book The Sermons of R.C. White, page 85. Thank you for supporting the channel. If you've made it this far in the video, then you are someone who is interested in studying with me, and I appreciate that very much. I shouldn't mention that this template for the PowerPoint was free online from Slides Carnival. And the only thing they ask of, of me or you is to give them credit in your slide presentation. So Slides Carnival for this template that we used today. If you'd like this video, subscribe to the channel, make a comment, and share a link to it with your friends. That would be also greatly appreciated. Thank you for studying with me today. Until we meet again, may God bless.